Hey guys, my name is Frank, and this is the Poth on Programming video log. If you click this video, you probably want to know more about pagination and how to do it. So stay tuned, and I'm going to show you how to implement pagination for your static website using pure JavaScript. In this video, I'm going to talk about what pagination actually is, and I'm going to show you the source code for this video in detail. Everything is written in pure JavaScript, so you don't need any external libraries. So definitely, if you have any questions about my code, leave them in the comments section below, or if you have any comments, leave them there too. And be sure to check out the source code and the working example that I have linked in the description of this video after you're done watching, so stay tuned. The first thing I want to talk about is what pagination actually is. Pagination is a verb that means to take a large chunk of content and break it into smaller, more manageable chunks. So to illustrate this, I wrote this example program that takes content from different files. Each file has a paragraph in it. I have five files. All five of them are loaded into this content div that you see on my browser window screen here. And basically, to illustrate pagination, I'm going to take these five files and break them into just individual content that I can click through with this next button. I can't do it now, but if I come over here to my HTML code and I come over here to where I instantiate my paginator, I can tell my paginator to break these files up into different content limits per page. So let's say I want two items on every page. I can come in, I can save, I can come back over to my example and refresh the screen, and now I only have two examples per page. I can even come over here and say one item per page. So if you have like an image gallery or something and you want to break up your images, say you have uh, 100 images in your gallery and you want to show one on every page, kind of like an interactive slideshow where the user can click through every image in your gallery, this would work perfectly, and it's really simple to implement. So as you can see, I'm breaking up this content into different pages. I can control how many items show up on each page, and it's really simple, really easy. It just tells you what page you're on. I'm on page 4 out of 5, now 3 out of 5. It has a back button and a next button. Typical paginators will usually have more than this. Sometimes they have a text input that allows you to go directly to the page that you input. And more often than not, they have uh, your current page. Like if you go to Google search and look this up right now, if I come over here to Google search and I search for pie and I scroll down to the bottom, they have a paginator at the bottom of their page. And it looks like, if I scroll over, it looks just like this. This is Google's paginator. So I'm on page one and there's a whole bunch of different pages and they've broken their content up into these links. And they have, I don't know what they have here, maybe 15 links per page. And I can navigate to any of these pages or I can click the next button. So pagination is just this. And that's pretty much all I can say about it. So now I am going to go ahead and show you the source code for what makes this work. So now I'm going to talk about how to actually implement this paginator here, how to actually get this to work for your website. I made it really modular and simple. Basically, all you have to do is import this paginator.js file into your HTML. You can then use this file in your HTML as follows. So this is my HTML document. Inside the head, all I have to do is import this script, the paginator.js script. And then when I want to use my paginator inside of my HTML, all I have to do is throw this script tag in with a call inside of it to the paginator.create method. And I'm going to get into all that, but first I'm just going to talk about what this actually takes as parameters. So what my paginator method takes as parameters are an array of files to paginate. You can do, I guess, this paginator just paginates different file contents, but you could tweak this to paginate the contents of one very large file as well. Basically, what I want to show you is just the principles of how to make a paginator and what a paginator is. This might not be the best fit for your needs, so definitely get the source code, tweak it, look at it, learn how to make your own. It's actually a lot more simple than you think. So all I'm doing is I'm taking an array of text files, and the text files look just like this. This is only the first one, but they all look just like this. The contents are just text. 
and I'm throwing in an array of all of my text files. And then I'm going to hand in the page to start on, and I'm going to hand in how many items per page I want. So this method is the paginator.create method. So if I come up here to my paginator.js file, and I scroll down to the bottom here, paginator.create. By the way, this file, the paginator file, is only 165 lines long, and there's lots of white space and comments, so it's not intimidating. If you download this code or go just check it out on my GitHub, don't have to download anything, just look at it. It's not intimidating at all. It's actually pretty straightforward to learn and just think about in your head. You'll understand it really easily. So the paginator.create method, I'm just going to go through it and tell you what each line does, and I'm going to take a look at other functions as they're called. So the create method, like I said, takes a list of links to files with content. So these links could easily be image files. So like I was saying for that image gallery, you could easily throw in links to image files and then load them. Maybe you want five or ten a page, or maybe you just want one a page. Easy to do that with this method. The index is just the start index, where you're starting, so which which item in that links array is going to be loaded first as your first page. And then the limit is how many items show up per page. Then we're going to get a handle to the script tag because this create method will actually remove the script tag inside your HTML. So once your page is parsed, this script tag will be replaced with only the HTML of your paginator. So you're not going to see this in your final page script. So if I come out here and I inspect this page and I look inside of my body tag and I try to find my script tag where everything is taking place, if you look right here, you can see inside of my HTML, I have this big long comment and then I have the script tag that calls it. Well, inside of my rendered page, I have this big long comment and then right underneath, I don't have the script tag anymore. It has been replaced with my paginator HTML. So that's a pretty cool feature of this that's easy enough to implement. So I'm going to show you how that's done real quick. Basically, all you do is you get a handle to the current script that's being executed with document.currentscript. And then after you create the paginator, which creates all of its HTML inside of JavaScript, all you do is get the parent node of the, the current script tag, and you replace it with the paginator's HTML. So what is the paginator's HTML? Well, when I create a paginator object with all these parameters that I'm handing in, I am creating that HTML. So if I come all the way back up to the top, slowly scrolling with my mouse wheel, I can look inside of here, and this is the HTML for my paginator. Now, you can do this. You don't have to use JavaScript to create your paginator's HTML, but I did. I just figured it would be easier and more portable this way. The CSS to style it is up to you. I'm not going to go over the CSS. CSS is its own thing. Doesn't. There's no logic to it. There's just CSS. You need to learn it to style your stuff, and that's that. So I'm creating my HTML in JavaScript with a string of HTML, but you could just as easily make a template for this and throw it into your HTML page, or you could literally write this stuff out in your HTML and just get references to it in JavaScript, but this is how I did it. So while I'm here, the next thing that happens after I create my HTML for my paginator inside of the paginator constructor, by the way. So when I construct my paginator, I'm getting all of that information from my HTML that I hand in. So the list of links, the start index, and the number of items per page that I can have, I am going to create my HTML, and then I'm going to loop through it and add a click listener to all of my buttons. So the click listener is basically just going to be for the back button and the next button. So inside of my HTML, I've defined those buttons, and you can see them here. They're just divs, or actually they're anchor tags. So I have, here's a button, it's a paginator button, and it contains the text back. This is my back button, which is right here. And I have another one, which is my next button, which is right here, this anchor tag here, that is my next button. I'm not really going to worry about the HTML too much, I'm just going to worry about the 
code that makes everything work. So I'm adding my click listeners. What is inside of a click listener? If I go down to the click function here, this is the click listener. So this handles whenever I come over here and click one of these buttons with my mouse. So the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna check to see which button I'm pressing by looking at the inner HTML of the anchor tag. So like I said, the inner HTML of this one is back, the inner HTML of this one is next. It's gonna check to see what the inner HTML of the button I'm pressing is. If it's the back button, I am going to change the index of my links array that I'm loading from. So in this case, I'm loading the URL in index one of my links array, which is the article one dot text up here. So that's why you can see this text loaded at index of zero, or I guess index of one inside of my links tag. So all this is doing is it's getting the current index that I'm on and it's subtracting the limit, which is the number of items that I can see per page from my current index. And that is going to set me back that many number of items unless it's going past zero, which means I would be going past page one, backwards past page one to page zero or page negative one or negative two, which is impossible, so I'm not gonna do that. So basically, I'm just getting the number of indexes or the number of items to shift backwards or forwards if I'm pressing the next button, and I'm adding that to the current index, and finally, I'm calling the paginator.change index method. Now, this is where all the exciting stuff happens because change index is going to be responsible for loading up the content from the pages and putting it into my div tag here. So let's go ahead and find that. If I scroll up, I think this is inside of my paginator's prototype, and it is. Here's the change index function. So the change index function is kind of complicated. I'm not going to talk about it in too much depth, but basically what it does is it gets a reference to my paginator content, which is the div that you see the content in. And it will scroll it to the top whenever you click next or back. It'll scroll that to the top. So say I have a long content. If I scroll to the bottom and I click next, it'll scroll it back up to the top instead of being scrolled to the bottom on the next text that it loads. So that's important to, to uh, do that. Scroll back up to the top. Uh, the content strings, these are going to be the loaded content strings from my files. The reason I have to do this whole big method is this whole big convoluted looking thing just to load text into a div is because when you're using XML HTTP requests to load stuff, it can load out of order because it's asynchronous. So I can request to load three files at a time, but those three files might not load in the order that I asked for them from the server. So this is why I have to do this whole big convoluted method here. And if you want a more in-depth explanation, I suggest you go and take a look at the source code that I have linked in the description because I have all these comments in here to show you exactly what each line is doing and each block is doing. I don't want to read this to you because that would be kind of boring and you can just do it for yourself. So I just want to give you a brief overview of what's going on here. So I'm creating an array of content strings. I am determining how many items can actually fit on this page because if I'm close to the end of my items, the end of uh, what I can actually load, like say I'm in a book and there's 100 pages in the book and I am on page 99 and I'm showing two pages of my book on my website, I'm not going to be able to show the next page past 100 because it just doesn't exist. So that's what this is doing. Uh, I have to keep track of the number of items that have loaded. This way we can make sure we're loading them in order and we're not trying to load what isn't there. And inside of this loop, what's happening is I'm requesting the content from the server with the request content method that I'm going to show you real soon. Inside of that, it's just an XML HTTP request that requests files from the server, that's it, and then returns their response text. So that's it. So inside of this, and these will be called and executed asynchronously. But since I'm using the let keyword in my for loop, I'm going to be able to keep track of what index inside of my for loop 
this function was called on. And that's going to allow me to arrange my content inside of the content strings array in the appropriate order, which is extremely important because you don't want to load your pages or your content out of order because that can be confusing to your users. So basically inside of here, every time one thing is loaded, one of my pages is loaded, I'm going to increase loaded. I'm going to store that thing in my content strings array at the appropriate index. So this keeps track of when the things were called this for loop here. I'm going to store that thing that was just loaded by request content. And I'm going to store it at the appropriate index inside of my content string. And I'm just going to store the response text in there. And I'm going to put some break lines around it. This way, if we load more than one item, we get breaks in between them. And if I have loaded all, say I'm loading three items at a time, if I've loaded all three, and that's greater than or equal to the limit of things I can load, then I'm going to actually reset my content divs inner HTML to nothing. And I'm going to concatenate all the strings inside of my content strings array inside of the content divs inner HTML. So that's going to actually parse all of the text into my content div of my paginator. So hopefully that made sense. Hopefully that wasn't too long and convoluted an explanation. The last thing I have to show you about this is the paginator dot request content method. And that's really simple. All it is is just an XML HTTP request. It's requesting the file names, the URL. So let's say I'm requesting file one, it would just request article one dot text. Really simple. That's the URL for that file. Um, and it has a callback for when the server actually loads that content hands it back to me. It's going to call this function, which is going to call the callback with the request in it inside of my let's scroll back up here inside of my request content function here. I'm handing it a callback, which does all of this. Oh, scrolled too far there. Oh my gosh. Scrolled way too far. Okay. Stop scrolling. Okay. So that's going to be this function here is going to be the callback that gets called by request content. And I just showed you all of this and what it does. It just loads that content in the right order into my content divs inner HTML. So that is my improvised, not scripted explanation of what this program does. I hope it actually helped you and didn't hinder you in any way. So that is how everything works. Now that I've gone over how to actually program this thing and showed you a little bit about what paginators are supposed to be and what they're supposed to do, I'm going to talk about should you even use a static paginator or a paginator for a static website? Because that's what this is. I wouldn't recommend it personally unless you have a really small site with just a couple of things to maintain, like say a photo album, and you want to use this method to flip through photos in your photo album or you're a blogger and you have some articles and you put out a couple articles a month or whatever, and it's easy enough to maintain the list of articles. But when you start doing changes to your website, having a list of files in your HTML like this is going to kill you. It's going to kill you when you try to refactor all this and just move this around. If you change your directory system, your file system, for your website, this is going to kill you. All the legwork that it takes to physically maintain long list of files and stuff like that. Say you have a thousand articles, you are definitely not going to want to rewrite a thousand article URLs into your HTML. So I recommend, unless you have a very small static site and you're not doing much with it, and you're not changing it around much, I recommend getting a dynamic server, getting a host to host your personal backend server and have that take care of loading all your files for you. Another alternative would be a static site builder. I use GitHub pages and I know they offer Jekyll. That's a static site builder. I don't use it because I do things the hard way and it's probably stupid, but I enjoy writing code. So it's just fun for me, but they have something called Jekyll. It's a static site builder. And what a static site builder does is it looks inside of your directory. And it will take all of these files, all these article files, and it will 
put them into a file that you can then have access to those file names dynamically. So it's automatically going to load everything up and you can access it from the client side just like you would be able to access it from a server. But with static web pages, you do not have access to file names in your directories unless you explicitly ask for them by name. So that's why it's really tedious to search for these files from your client side, from your HTML or JavaScript code, because you actually have to know what they're called and type it in explicitly. With a static site builder, you can kind of work around that, makes it a lot easier. And with a dynamic server on the back end, you don't even have to worry about that at all. It can just search inside your directory for you, and you don't even have to know what anything is called. You can do awesome stuff with that, but it's going to cost you more because you're going to have to pay a host. So do I recommend using a paginator on a static site? Not necessarily. If it's a small site, cool. If you're doing it for fun, very cool. Uh, but if you have a big goal for your website and you eventually want to refactor it and update it and make changes to it and have search engines and lots of articles and lots of images that you're going to paginate and you're going to be able to load up content and stuff dynamically, then you're definitely going to want to have your own dynamic server. So that's all I wanted to say about that. I just made this example because one of my viewers asked me to and I, I looked it up and I had no idea what it was and I thought, actually, this is pretty common and I should know how to do this. So I built this basic example. With this example, you can tweak it a little bit and you can make it work for a dynamic server and you can tweak it to add in uh, different pages that you can click directly on. You could have a, a manual input pretty easily. I just made this so you guys could take a look at the source code and get an idea of what a paginator actually is. So hopefully this video helped. Hopefully you go check out the working example here and the source code. I have those links in the description below and I hope you guys learned something. Anyway, that's all I got to say on the matter. So you guys have a good day and stay tuned for the next video because it's probably going to be pretty cool too. Have a good one.